Hey y'all, welcome back to the channel. If you are new, I invite you to subscribe and not only will help Melissa pass that huge mile marker of the 100 subscriber threshold, but it actually does really help happy period content get out to a larger audience. I have committed to making happy period content once a week. I'm going to try and do it more, but it really does help get it out to a larger, a potentially larger audience than what we hold here with our local social media channels like Instagram, Facebook, newsletters, etc. So please subscribe, please share, um, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down if this is content that speaks to you, and please, please, please comment. Uh, it means the world to have a dialogue, especially when it comes to this issue. It's one thing to get comments on Disney vlogs, it's one thing to get comments when I go off on a jerk and tangent about the Handmaid's Tale or Legion or whatever the fuck it is I'm watching, but this is actually something that matters. And so if you have questions, if you have feedback, if you have ideas, please comment. Also, if you're not comfortable doing it in the YouTube comments, always in the description of the Happy Period vlogs, there's going to be links to our Facebook, our Instagram. So please DM me privately, DM my partners privately. We would be thrilled to help you start something in your own community and or answer any questions you have and take any ideas or feedback you have and run with them. Uh, that's my cat. Also, there's work going on in the garden. Here we are. Oh, this is Rickles. This is my new lock cat from Batu. Anywho, as I tend to do with any happy period vlog, and again, with my channel, you're either going to be finding me talking about periods, Disney, or film and TV. It's your lucky day we're talking about periods. As with any happy period vlog, I'm just going to give you the high level one, two, three readers digest moment. You will find a full blown happy period playlist on my channel. And if you want to kind of come out a little bit further than that, there is also a women's issues playlist that goes beyond that, that includes larger discussions as well as the happy period content and some film and TV reviews as it uh, pertains to women. So feel free to check this out. I'll link some in the I cards and in the description. But today we're talking about happy period. And again, when I do a happy period vlog, if you're new to the channel or new to this content, I'm just gonna give you the high level. Happy period is a nonprofit. It's a full 5013C. Its full name is hashtag happy period. And it was founded by Chelsea Von Chaz back in 2015. What it is in its essence is a grassroots effort to provide menstrual hygiene, products, education, and access to the homeless and underserved women and menstruates in any community. Started in LA, uh, I helped co-found the Bay Area chapter in 2016 with my friend Jordan. I now co-run it with Julie and Addie and Zena and Aisha and Cameron, and we have grown to support Oakland, Berkeley, San Francisco, Pleasanton, and some surrounding areas. The idea is that you host a period packing party, or however you see that manifesting, but basically a drive would be part A, where you invite your community, your classmates, your workmates, your cohorts, your peers, your friends, your family, your church members, uh, parish members to come out the local small businesses in your community to come out and donate pads, liners, tampons, baby wipes, underwear, um, and anything else that you feel might be relevant to put in a pack, but basically you're going to invite the community to donate said items, and you're going to break that inventory down and create individual packs in a Ziploc bag, in a brown bag, in whatever you see fit, whatever's inexpensive, whatever makes sense for you in your community. And you're going to uh, essentially assemble a month's supply of what a menstruator would need to get them through the month. So a combination of set items. Now we say the word menstruator on purpose because we know that trans men bleed and we know that there are women that no longer bleed, whether they are over a certain age, whether they've had hysterectomies. So we simply offer it to anyone that our intuition tells us might need and 
you know, a kit, and we let them tell us yes, no, maybe so, or wherever they fall in between. And that being said, that's the distribution side. You go out directly to the streets, folks that you find on the street, folks that might be in encampments, and or those that are in shelters, be it homeless shelters, sober living homes, domestic violence shelters, wherever you feel intuitively or know for a fact that your community needs this product, these products, excuse me. And again, I will say, and I will repeat every time that I can remember to do it, even the most affluent of communities needs these products in their shelters because we live in a society where we're going on 2020. This is still a taboo topic. This is again going to be the subject of the video and I will get there once I'm done with my rant. Cheers. But we still live in a society where it took me until I was 34 years old, 33, 34 years old, when I founded the co-founded the Bay Area chapter with my friend Jordan to even have this enter into my awareness. Again, you think of homelessness, what comes to mind? Food and shelter, canned goods, canned good drive. It took me being alive on this planet as somebody who believes and has suffered with dysmenorrhea and extreme pain and ovarian cysts 33, 34 years before I read an article about Chelsea and the mission to have the light bulb go off and go, oh shit, what the fuck does a homeless woman do when she's bleeding? Or a homeless menstruate. Ding, 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 ding. So imagine that how many more light bulbs need to go off, okay? So I invite you to ask yourself that question. Ask your friends and family that question. Even the women in your life, ask them that question because it's really something that we, we take for granted. We don't think of this as an issue. So rant almost over. It's very simple to get involved in your community. You don't need permission. You don't need to be part of any one organization. There are many nonprofits across the country and world doing this work. You don't need their permission. You can start your own 5013C or you can just start doing the work and help out these women and these menstruators that need access to some hygiene, some dignity, and some peace of mind and if you've given them a month's worth of that, well, you've done more than most people probably have for them since they've been living on the street. So, rant over, sip of wine. What this video actually is about is an article that I came across uh, whilst looking for content to share both on Instagram and on our Facebook channels. Um, and it's basically, um, it's a topic that I have written about as a grad student. It's a topic that we discuss here in our community as people that are working with Happy Period. It's a discussion that I've just had with women in general and men. Um, get your men involved, get your men involved. Um, but I've, I've heard it in bits and pieces, whether it's in written me media or video media on the news. This was the first article. Somebody's trying to get us attention and get us to do some happy period work. Excuse me. There's work going on in my garden now. This is the first time I've seen, excuse me, an article come out that spoke explicitly to this topic, which is titled, Periods Are Political, Parentheses, Here's Why. Now this came out on medium.com, or and I'm sure it was published elsewhere too. Um, and I'll link the article and the author in the description box, but I found it actually through an organization called Menstrual Health Hub. If you're not following them on social media, I highly recommend that you do. This is a grassroots community of men and women that are doing a lot of work, especially in Africa, in various countries to A, destigmatize, and B, provide education and access to menstrual hygiene for the underserved women domestically and internationally. Anyways, I found this article uh, on Menstrual Health Hub and it's speaking to the, politici the politicization of menstruation. I personally believe that the personal is political. Um, 
whether or not you agree with that statement is for you to decide. But I do think that because we are moving into 2020 and there is still taboo and stigmatization around menstruation, about even talking about it, about even thinking about what people go through, um, the lack of knowledge that boys and men, men even have about what goes on, and more than that, the lack of awareness and education that even myself and other women have around how our bodies function, how to care for them, um, what the implica implications are of our cycles. It's just such a shame and it's such a detriment to culture and society and the health of the women the people that are capable of populating the earth that this is not something that is talked about it's not something that's taught so anyways this article um is it's a short read it's maybe like a three minute read and i i will link it down below is about this and it, it specifically discusses um i don't want to mispronounce her name a, again, I apologize for the background noise. Turn your volume up. Uh, there was a, a collegiate student in Germany in 2018, a, a, a Berlin-based student, uh, undergrad, she was trying to write her bachelor's thesis around, I don't know the specifics, it's not stated in the article, but something around the taboo about menstruation. When she went to her advisors and her faculty, she found literally no one that would support her or give her the go-ahead to write this thesis for whatever reason they didn't feel like it would it would land. She went ahead and wrote it, and after she wrote it, she ended up publishing an article on Facebook about the experience. I'm gonna pause and wait for this to, to be over. Hey y'all, so we're going to take that one from the top. Sorry, there was a little bit of background noise from some work going on in the garden. But anyways, the article that I'm referencing, again, I'll link it down below, um, starts off by talking about this young woman who was trying to write her bachelor's thesis back in 2018 as a student in Berlin. Her name is Franca Fried, or, or excuse me, Franca Frey. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. She had solicited her solicited her advisors and faculty uh, to support her thesis and no one would. Uh, for whatever reason, they don't go into a great deal of detail. Um, no one felt like this thesis was either relevant, appropriate, or, or would land. Long story short, she goes ahead and writes the thesis and after, I don't know if it's after graduation, but after she writes it, she goes to Facebook and essentially uh, writes about her experience trying to get her thesis the support that it needed. And the article is basically using this as a preface excuse me, to discuss the fact that even in 2019 in a modern first world country, uh, one as modern as Berlin, this is still a subject that is taboo and that people don't want to touch. Um, and they go on to say, quote, that her story also proves another point, that menstruation is a political issue that intersects with almost every sphere of society, un end quote. And this is why we need to draw inspiration from her story and talk about it, the article goes on to say. So, let me get my bearings. You all know I got notes. So, the article cites a book by author Judy Gran, and it's called Everyday De Decor. Let's take that one from the top. Uh, it's called Everyday Discourses of Menstruation: The Cultural and Societal Perspectives. I've not read this book. This is my first time hearing of this book. I will be purchasing this book. Uh, but again, uh, the article speaks to how this particular book dissects this topic in greater detail. I would go a step further and recommend a book that I was introduced to about two years ago on accident. Uh, one of my good friends, neighbors, and uh, a faculty at the school that I attend uh, owns this book and it's called Blood, Bread, and Roses. And Blood, Bread, and Roses is by, what is it? 
what did I do with her name? Oh no. Wait, did I get? Okay. This is why I drink. Okay. So the book cited in the article, which is called Everyday Discourses on Menstruation, Cultural and Societal Perspectives, is not by Judy Grant. That one, in fact, is by Victoria Kaus Newton. The book I'm referencing that I was introduced to by Happy Accident, Blood, Bread, and Roses, is by Judy Gran. Judy Gran, not sure how you want to pronounce that, G-R-A-H-M. I'll link it. It's basically a, um, a historical telling of uh, the way menstruation has been viewed culturally and ritually since the dawn of time. So I feel like both of these books are going to have some overlap, but also um, come at it one from, uh, it seems like Blood, Bread, and Roses is more of a cultural, historical, ritualized uh, situation, whereas um, Miss Victoria House Newton's book, or Kaus Newton, I'll link it, uh, is more of the societal, socio-political moment. So anyways, um, the book that they reference in the article, Miss Newton's Everyday Discourses on Menstruation, uh, does talk about, you know, some of the earliest mentions in at least West Western history uh, of menstruation uh, with the book of Leviticus in the Bible, which some of you, if you grew up with the Bible, whatever your religious upbringing, uh, might be familiar with knowing that um, it does not take kindly to the menstruations. It does not take kindly to the women's. Uh, Leviticus is hardcore, um, unclean woman is needs to be removed from the situation like there is no like inclusivity uh, moment when it comes to the blood in Leviticus they're having none of it in Leviticus woman go away until you're clean again they also cite uh, the corpus hit hippocratium and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right which is embarrassing because I am a philosophy major but I'm not good with words sometimes. But the Corpus Hi Hippocratium, uh, which dates to four to 500 BC, and it is linked to Aristotle. I don't think that we know for sure if it is uh, tied to him officially, but of course it is speaking to the beginnings of what would become the Hippocratic Oath, right? Do no harm. Uh, but in both of these texts, Western, texts, even though Leviticus, you could argue, is not actually Western, but stay with me, um, are basically both speaking to the uncleanliness of a woman during her time of the month, and the, uh, the, the book that they're referencing, the Corpus Hippocratic Hippocraticum, that's easier, the Corpus Hippocraticum, um, they basically, in that one specifically, Leviticus too, um, but they basically present menstruation as an impure process, as an unholy process, a sinful process, um, and specifically in the Hippocraticum, they link it to women's uh, nature as being weak and inferior, and at this point in time when the Corpus Hippocraticum is out, we're talking four to 500 BC, we're also now kind of as a as a uh, culture, as a society, we're already in the mindset that um, menstruation leads to mania in women, and that at this juncture they were seeing the penis as, or excuse me, take that one from the top. They were viewing the vagina as an inverted penis. Now, let moment take a sip. I'll let y'all unpack that comment below. But that's where we were in the 400 to 500 BCs. We can't be mad, that's just where we were. But, you know, we've come a long way. Um, I don't know that we've come far enough. Well, I know we haven't. But what was interesting, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this gentleman, Pliny the Elder, um, who existed between 23 and 79 AD, um, the tight Anno Domini, uh, his real name is Gaius Plinius Secundus, learning things every day, but he is, you know, through popular culture, he is known as Pliny the Elder. 
was one of these gentlemen that propagated the uh, myth and at the time the fact that you know women when they were menstruating had supernatural powers and they were not the fun kind they were the destruct destructive kind the kind that you know all men should be frightened of specifically that when a woman was on her period she could turn wine sour and call, cause food to go bad among many other things in 1958 listen to that in 1958 the year of our lord 1958 Pliny the elder passed away in 79 79 in the year of our lord 1958 was when officially the medical community deemed menstruation harmless not to the woman to those that she might inflict sour grapes upon so i would just like you to uh, sit on that for a moment so the article goes on to talk about you know how we have a long way to go yada 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 and it speaks to, it touches on this just like the, the teensiest little bit but i mean even look at your maxi pad and your tampon ads that are on tv today and that have been on tv since television advertisement was born do they use red no they use blue they use a neutral cool color it's just water it's just windex that comes out of us there's been a couple ads, none are going to come to mind right now, but I've cited articles in my women's group on Facebook of advertisements that have come out uh, in more recent years where they are actually starting both in print and in television to show red when selling and advertising pads and tampons, which again, with all of the violence that we are exposed to in film, in television, in video games, and most importantly, in real life, for some reason, we can't handle blood coming out of a vagina. We can't deal with it. One of the greatest moments, I think, of television on its own in the past decade, but specifically when it comes to a moment for women in television and just in pop culture is where my Game of Thrones people at is I think it's in season two or season three of Game of Thrones where Jon Snow is with the wildlings behind the wall and he meets Ygrid and they're falling in love and then they go to the cave and they're about to bang out and you know he's getting undressed he's a virgin he's very freaked the fuck out and you know he's got some scars from battle because you know it's it's Jon Snow and you know poor thing he's just trying to be so sweet he's telling Ygrid you know be wary you know you might see some blood but you know avert your eyes you delicate delicate flower you even though that bitch is a wildling and she comes through with one of the greatest lines in all of pop culture and she says she laughs at him and she says girls see more blood than boys and like just shuts that shit right the fuck down so anyways we are, we are still living in medieval mindsets when it comes to this when Rupi Carr the poet posted a picture of her laying down in her bed on Instagram about two and a half three years ago with blood seeping out where you see the blood stain on her butt that shit went viral that shit like was the talk of the town why 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 though so we still are living in a culture of of hiding this stuff and again to chelsea von chaza's credit and the happy period mission the destigmatization and the breaking the taboo around this is critical i just posted on our um, Instagram stories, uh, which we were invited to do by her, the first time we got our period. Like, just give us a tight moment of when you got your period. Well, I was 11, um, and you know, I got my period. I was at PE. I thought I was dying. I never experienced pain like that. Long story long, you know, being in sixth grade, being 11 years old, and having your period around boys, and I'm using that word purposefully here like boys in the worst sense right like 
they're making fun of girls, like they were making fun of girls for not shaving their legs, they were just the worst fucking creature ever because you wanted them, you wanted them to want you, but they were not capable of being that mature. And you have to, even amongst your, not just to hide it from the boys, but to hide it from other girls, you would put either your pads or your tampons in your pencil case, or you'd have a special pencil case where you'd put your pads and your tampons, and you'd raise your hand and go, may I go to the bathroom? And you would carry your little pouch to the bathroom. Meanwhile, everybody knows what the fuck you're doing because who's carrying a pencil case to the bathroom? Why are we still doing this? You should be able to put a tampon out of your backpack, I don't care if you're 7, 8, 9, 10, 36 years old, at work, pull that shit out, raise your hand and say, I gotta plug it up. I just don't understand. I don't understand. Like, we watch porn, we watch violence, we can't handle period blood. Like, what is it about blood coming out of a vagina that has everyone shook? Even us, even us, the ones whose vaginas are bleeding, we still don't talk about it. We still really don't understand it. We still really don't understand the nuance and the power physiologically, spiritually, psychologically, cosmically, yes, I'm a philosophy major, deal with it, of what our menstrual cycle is. And it just, it befuddles, it, it befuddles me. Hmm. The article names it, listen, and I quote, we simply cannot avoid menstruation. Because of this, periods intersect with so many spheres of society and raise important questions about human rights, gender equality, education, healthcare, the environment, and the economy. Now, let's look at a couple of these uh, moments really quickly. Now, human rights is probably like the big umbrella under which these other finer points fall. It is a human right to have access to clean water, hygiene, but we know that this is not the world we live in, right? Like, especially uh, if you're not privileged enough to be in a first world. There is an acronym called, uh, excuse me, WASH, called WASH, W-A-S-H, which refers to, um, sorry, I'm getting confused with my notes, uh, which refers to access to water, sanitation, and hygiene, WASH, water, the A, sanitation, and hygiene. Okay, wash. It is a human right to have access to water, running water, clean water. But this is not the case for most people in the world. And even in the first world, again, why Happy Period and other nonprofits like this exist, there are homeless people on the street without running water, without any potable water. How are they supposed to keep themselves clean, especially as a, a woman or a menstruator during that time of the month? How? Second point they raise is gender equality. Okay, we've already discussed that trans men bleed. If you were born a female and you have for whatever variety of reasons, choices, or biological imperative, decided to transition to the gender with which you identify with for whatever those reasons may be if you were born excuse me a male is what i meant to say and you've decided to transition to female you are still bleeding now whatever wherever you are on that on that trajectory or on that course whether you have fully transitioned and have decided to Get, a, uh, get rid of your uh, reproductive organs, take hormones, get gender reassignment surgery, and have nothing, you know, oh, I misspoke. I was speaking about being born female. I'm getting twists turned around. If you were born female and have decided to become a man, you are a trans man, whatever course you're on, however far you are along in your trajectory or wherever you've chosen to land on that spectrum of transition, Again, whether it's no hormones and just dressing the part and identifying as a man to having full gender reassignment surgery. Up until the point where you have had your hysterectomy, 
are on full hormones and have had gender reassignment surgery, you are likely still bleeding in some form or fashion. So yes, we know that trans men bleed. Men that are male passing, trans men that are male passing are bleeding. So gender equality comes into this on that level and it also just comes into it on the level of we don't take care of our women domestically in the first world, internationally in the first world, and especially not in second and third world countries. We still have gen genital mutilation. We still have, name it, okay? Like we're, we're banning fucking abortion in eight states in the United States of America in the year of our Lord 2019. Gender equality is a big part of menstrual equity, access, excuse me, gender equality. Don't get it twisted. Education and healthcare. Well, healthcare is, you know, I mean, we can do a whole moment on healthcare. Healthcare and education, I think, I'll just speak to those at, together to save time and save us all um, a 30 to 50 minute rant from Melissa. Sex, sex education begins in the home. I'm not a parent, but I was raised by what the kids call today a woke as fuck parent. And I went to private Catholic school. So my sex education, had it not come from the home, I might be a different person, leading a different life. Sex education should begin in the home. Schools should, however, private or public, private's a little bit of a different conversation because they have leverage with their agendas, but in so far as public education is concerned, should be providing young men and young women and those who identify in between with access to legitimate science about reproductive health about their bodies, about their sexual organs, about sex, about sex education, as far as what sex actually is, um, how to have um, safe sex, uh, contraceptions, the whole thing, um, what the repercussions of not having safe, safe sex are, like all of this. And this is not happening in a consistent way anywhere in the first world or in the West, in, in the Western first world. So imagine how out of control things are where groups like Menstrual Health Hub are working in certain countries in Africa where it's AIDS is still seen as a demon inhabiting you and that you can have sex with a virgin and get rid of AIDS. I mean, we are still living in a world with pre-modern values and pre-modern levels of cognitive development even here in the modern West. So we need to be aware of that and I, I think it's fair that they bring up the education and healthcare points because they, they tie hand in hand and of course with both there has to be funding, right? And then they go on to say the economy and the environment. Well the economy, yes. We talked about in the last vlog the period tax which falls under the umbrella of the pink tax, where women's products like razors um, and other grooming items are priced higher than the exact same item that's marketed to a man. But specifically the tampon tax, uh, menstrual hygiene products are taxed at an exorbitant rate. There are certain states and Canada that are working or already have eliminated said tax, but the idea is that these items should be free. You go into a bathroom, your employer, your municipality provides you with toilet paper. Why aren't they providing you with sanitary napkins? Why? Why? And that's for those of us that are living in a paradigm of privilege. A homeless person should be able to go into a public restroom. Well, they should be able to go into a public restroom, period, end of story. That's a different conversation without fear of arrest, but they should be able to go into a public restroom and not only find toilet paper, but these women and menstruators should be able to find menstrual hygiene products at no cost. The environment is the final point they make. We tend to forget that 
what we flush down the toilet, just like what with what we throw away, um, affects our environment, right? We're living in a very out of sight, out of mind uh, paradigm since the Industrial Revolution, and we're seeing it with the Amazon on fire, the ice is melting, we're all going to die, it's just doom and gloom. But we as women also must take responsibility and be aware that when we discard our waste when we're menstruating, you know, we're throwing things away that are not only um, infected, I, I shouldn't say infected, but are saturated with our DNA and our blood and are dangerous in that sense, but we throw, think about how many pads and tampons are thrown into waste situations, whether it's the dump or even worse, where they're starting to end up the ocean, not even starting to, like, okay, I mean, it's, this article is so spot on because it's naming it. This is a political issue that has implications in every single aspect of society. Reusables are great for those of us that have access to wash, right? Water, sanitation, hygiene. If you have the means, yes, experiment with a cup or a flex or something reusable. Or at the very least, if you have the means, spend the extra money and buy your disposable pads and tampons from companies like The Honey Pot, who's been a, a very gracious sponsor of Happy Period and has just recently donated a large amount of pads to Happy Period Bay Area. So shout outs to have The Honey Pot Company. Um, but I say all that to say companies like The Honey Pot Co and Cora, and I'm sure there's many, many others, and we need many, many more, are making organic products, which are not only better for us as women, because we all know about the TSS, we all know about um, just the shit that you, I mean, you're putting something inside of the most delicate absorbent tissue in your body. Uh, it should be fucking organic. But that conversation aside, when we get rid of these products and we flush them or we throw them aside, they're going into the environment. And other animals, other um, creatures, and just the firmament itself, the soil, the earth on which we live, is suffering because these products are not sustainable, they are toxic, they carry chemicals. So if it's harming the environment, trust and believe it's harming your pussy's environment. So anyways, this article, you're just, you're just going to love it. Um, and that's just the, that's just one part of it. The other part of it is the pain element. I posted on Instagram the other day, and I'm still on my period. Um, I had a really bad moment. I've always had really bad cramps since I was 11. Um, some months I'm fine, and some months I can't function. I Some months I want to go to the ER. Some months I have gone to the ER. Remember the worst pain you've ever been in whilst on your period and pretend you're in sweltering heat or freezing cold or just simply have nowhere to sit down because you're homeless and no access to a bathroom without fear of arrest. On top of that, you have no pain relievers. Imagine what that might feel like. This entire discussion is political. And in that Instagram post, I mentioned that if you ever gave a woman or a menstruator shit for not being able to go into work or do work because they were on their period, you should be shot in the face. Obviously, that's a haha -ha joke, but it's also not. I have a job that has unlimited vacation, but if I quote unquote call in sick or use a sick day, I still get a little bit of like, there's still the tension there of like, do you, you know, like, eh, come on, like, mm, mm. and it's like, no. There are countries that are fighting for women to have paid time off during their period, which I am all for, uh, but I mean, we can't even get this for maternity leave, so let's shit in one hand and wish in the other. But I say all of that to say that when a woman is cramping, and she is uh, food in her belly, a roof over her head, a job. 
and she has to be made to feel like she might put her job in jeopardy because she needs to sleep or rest. That's what I call bullshit. It's almost 2020, y'all. Like, if you're not going to give women time off, specifically in and around their menzies, at the very least, don't give them shit, side eye, question them when they need to take time off during their menses. That's the least you can do. And what's interesting is that it's not coming from men, in my experience. Most of my bosses in the recent past, at least the ones that I directly report to, have been female and I get it from them. And it's like, excuse me, what Black Mirror episode am I living in? I just really don't understand. Anyways, the article, I'm almost done, y'all. The article ends with something that I, uh, a statistic which I found quite, quite, uh, stunning. And it is this, and all of this will be linked below. Studies show that when girls and women get the same access to education as boys, they marry later, have fewer and healthier children, experience less sexual violence, and get this, fasten your seatbelts, raise their country's annual per capita by 0.3% for every 1% or more girls who attend secondary education. Let's read that last part again. Studies show that when girls and women get the same access to education as boys, they raise their country's annual per capita by 0.3% for every 1% more girls who attend secondary education. So educate your girls at home, educate your boys at home, but educate your girls at home. Let's fund education for girls. Let's take care of our girls across the globe who don't have access to fucking running water. They need to be educated so they know that they can't have the HIV fucked out of them. We need to educate people so we don't shoo any, literally evict people that are already homeless off the street. What is happening? It's the year of our Lord, 2019. So again, the article ends with hence periods are political. It's about time we treat them that way instead of dismissing them as simply a women's issue. Amen, amen, amen. So I will invite you guys to please um, open a dialogue. Please comment below. If you're not comfortable commenting on a topic like this, I would invite you to ask yourself why. But also, if you're really not, but you want to get involved or do something as simple as making a donation or asking a question that you're just not comfortable doing on a public platform like YouTube, please go to our Facebook, our Instagram, use the DMs, use our email, ask us the questions because we're asking for the world not to shame women and menstruators. So. In return, we're not going to shame those of you who are not comfortable, for whatever reasons, how you were raised, excuse me, how you were raised, your socio-political backgrounds, your religious backgrounds. We're not here to shame you if you're not comfortable having discourse publicly. But I invite you to ask yourself why, and I invite, yourself, invite you to still ask the questions. Reach out. And we are here to support each other. We can only gain by supporting women. Whether or not you're pro-choice, you're pro-life, we can all agree that we all bleed as females, as women. We have to have comfortable conversations we have to get comfortable with the discomfort and then get rid of the discomfort because it is old and tired and boring and nobody cares. Um, we need to start having these conversations. We need to start getting comfortable with having them, especially with our boys, uh, so that they grow up 
knowing that this is not something to be hidden um, so that I don't have a 36 year old man asking me what a clot is uh, hashtag that just happened you know like Invite your boys, invite the men in your life to get involved with your happy period drives and distributions or whatever you might uh, decide or be inclined to do if, if you do decide to um, help support this or a similar mission. Get them involved because there is something to be said about a, all of us, but specifically men and boys handling pads and tampons that eliminates the mystery and the spookiness and the oh is she a witch what's happening you know like let's come on again it's the year of our lord 2019 thank you all for watching again please subscribe if you haven't please 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 comment uh it's important to have a dialogue i have another happy period video um about a similar but not so similar topic that we'll be uploading tomorrow um, so please stay tuned, again, share, and I really, 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 very much, and so does the Happy Period community and those that we serve, appreciate you watching because we want to get this out to a larger audience. So if you are watching, thank you for taking the time to do so. With that, I will say cheers one last time, and thank you. Love y'all.